we're here to show people around the State House visually, but also to, you know, um, get an understanding of the, of the governor's budget address today. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering from your position, uh, what you think is going to come down today and what, what are your thoughts about it? Well, I mean, first of all, one of the things we keep in mind generally is that the governor proposes and the legislature disposes. You know, we then, not that we just, uh, you know, don't accept any of his recommendations, but we are the ultimate arbiter of what goes in the budget. And so, you know, we then look at what the governor is putting out there as his priorities and try to find some common ground. I think we have to all keep in mind the governor received a huge mandate from the voters and so did the Democratic majority in the legislature. People are asking us to work together, and I hope we hear a lot about housing, transportation, some basic infrastructure issues. I think where we disagree with the governor, and we'll probably hear some of that, is the revenue needed to help support families with paid family leave and child care. I'm Senator Tanya Vihovsky. I am a senator from Chittenden Central. And Tanya, so you just heard the, the governor's budget address. Um, what are your first impressions uh, from what we heard from Governor Phil Scott? Yeah, I mean, the governor certainly is keen on making some record one-time investments, which I think is really important. You know, it was hard for me to hear some critical things left out. Um, you know, he is talking a lot about affordable housing, but he continues to talk about that as rentals only, which we know shuts middle and lower income people out of the wealth market. In this country, we hold the vast majority of our wealth in our home equity. And if we only discuss affordable housing as rentals, we're actually trapping people in cyclical poverty. So that was certainly, you know, disheartening to hear him continue to only talk about affordable housing in terms of rentals um, rather than building housing equity so people can afford to buy in the state. I mean, I'm the only renter in the Senate and I've given up on ever being able to afford to own a home here, which is, is really, unfortunately, the state for so many younger Vermonters. And, and it's, I think, why we have such a demographic problem. You know, I think the investment in childcare is important, but we know from the RAND study that's not enough. It is not actually going to ensure that every child has access to equitable, high quality childcare and that our early educators are getting paid fair and livable wages. So I'm, I'm happy that he is committing to making additional investment and we need to do more than that. Um, some of the other pieces that, you know, talking about substance use and mental health care, I'm a social worker, this is certainly critically important. And there was no reference to harm reduction services. We have seen year after year record deaths due to, sub due to overdoses, and we simply have to keep people alive. We can build out treatment services, and of course we need to do that, and we can build out prevention services, and of course we need to do that. But if people aren't alive, they can't access them. And so we we simply have to change the conversation and make investments in harm reduction. And we've seen across the globe, really, that when we do that, people are more engaged in treatment and prevention. Large, one, because it prevents death, but also because it builds trust and it builds the capacity for people to enter into those services when they're ready. The governor also really didn't mention the climate catastrophe. He talked a little bit about pollution and a little bit about clean water, but the reality of it is, is we are in an absolute catastrophe in terms of climate. I mean, we've seen it just this winter with extreme weather events and 60 degrees in January and, and flash freezing where we're being begged to stay off the roads by the Vermont State Police. And those events are just going to get more and more frequent. And so I think it was, it was frustrating to not hear that mentioned as well as not really talking about the climate resiliency that we need. Talking about investing in our mobile home parks is important, but we also need to talk about how we move the, the large largely low-income individuals out of flood zones, where is, which is where we put a lot of these mobile home parks. So I think that it was a only partially formed conversation. So we've just heard the address. You're uh, coming up with your thoughts. The you know the legislators are coming up with their um, their responses and their impressions on it. So what happens next, and how does the governor's budget get moved forward and and revised, and what does that process kind of look like? Yeah, it's kind of a complex process, and my understanding is it looks a little different on the House side than it does on the Senate side. And I'm obviously a little more familiar with the House process, having been there previously and being a new senator. But e the committees of jurisdiction that are working on policy points will certainly take into to consideration the things that he talked about and the things that he mentioned and where there might be points of 
compromise and where there might be spaces where we fundamentally disagree and, and the uh, appropriations committees will really go over that with a fine tooth comb and work with the policy committees of jurisdiction to try and flesh out what policies and what initiatives need to be funded in order to meet the needs of Vermonters. The capital bill, um, which is a separate from, which is sort of separate from the larger budget, will go to our um, institutions committees where they will start to look at the buildings and infrastructure and, and where they need to make investments and how that lines up with the governor's proposal and how maybe it doesn't. Um, and then the transportation committees will work on the transportation bill, um, again, to look at where they align with the governor's proposals and where they don't. Um, and then, you know, we know this governor ha has heavily used the veto pen, so there can always be those spaces if there's big enough disagreements where we get into that that space of vetoes and veto overrides. Yeah, do you expect now with um, the combination of the Democratic caucus now having a veto-proof majority, or at least that was something that the Democrats were celebrating on, on election night, I remember, is that something that you see potentially playing a role in this legislative session? I certainly think it'll play a role. I mean, I think it's important to keep in mind that the Democratic caucus is, has a wide range of, of where people sit and, and we have certainly been in a space in, in previous bienniums where we had on paper a veto proof majority and, and when some critical votes came down that's really not how things went down. I mean I do know that in both chambers we have historic super majorities so I think that that does give us a little bit more freedom and, and sort of protection in, in some of those instances but the at least my hope, and I certainly, you know, can can speak for the conversations we've had in the Senate Democratic Caucus. We don't want to to govern that way. We don't want to govern by ultimatum and veto, and that just it's bad governance. You know, we want to be at the table, and we want the administration at the table, building compromise and, and doing better work for Vermonters. But I certainly do think there are some some critical policies that have been vetoed in the past that we may try to move forward again because we feel that strongly that it is is what's best for Vermont and. You know, I can't speak for the governor, but we've certainly seen some interesting vetoes, like the pension veto last year that passed both houses unanimously and was still vetoed by the governor. So I don't anticipate that there will be zero vetoes. Just curious to know, do you think four million is enough for welcoming refugees? It seems to have the biggest standing ovation. So I'm just curious what you, you're thinking about that and where you think that money is going to go. Particularly, uh, do you think there's um, a need for language access? money <laughs> well the, to answer your first question no four million is not nearly enough to provide support and housing and and language access for new americans refugees immigrants you know anyone needing that i, I think part of the reason there was a is, a standing ovation to that is it's, in, in my knowledge, the first time that the governor's ever, ever publicly made mention of putting any money in, in that direction. And so I don't, I don't, I can't speak for every one of my colleagues, but I can certainly speak for the ones that, that I was sitting near and have spoken to after that. Of course it's not enough. Um, where exactly it'll go, we'll, we'll have to wait until we see the more detailed budget from the governor um, and, and how we want to work with that. You know, I, in my first internship, actually worked with New Americans through Connecting Cultures and Burlington, and so it's and, and being, you know, the representative for Chittenden Central, where we have our most diverse cities and, and the most need for those supports. I think it, it is critically important, and four million is not even close to enough, especially, you know, in this moment when we're starting to see more more refugees coming. You know, particularly we're seeing a lot of influx from the war in Ukraine. We just heard the governor's budget address. Um, what are your first impressions? What did you hear from the governor? And what might have been left out in that speech? Well, my first impressions was that, um, you know, there's a, a couple of policy areas that actually line up with what House and Senate progressives have said are our priorities. But I left with the under the um, the underlining impression, though, that there are all tiny little incremental investments in areas that need much more significant attention to actually make systemic change or to make a significant enough change to really address some of the crises facing us. And two, in particular, that stood out. Um, uh, House and Senate progressives talk a lot about economic dignity. That's one of our priorities this biennium. That looks at really supporting working families, looking at our housing crises, looking at workplace protections for workers, things that wrap around in a deeper, more meaningful way around workforce development and figuring out what really um, protects workers and helps retain workers and, and good paying jobs. So when the governor talked about housing, um, he he talked about putting some more money into the VHIP program, which up, um, upfits basically blighted properties. Properties. And what, we've put a lot of investments of federal money into housing, new building, and, and again, upfitting blighted properties.
property. But one of the continued things I am looking at is where are tenants in this, this conversation? We are moving a lot of money towards developers and landlords, but when we think about who is most struggling in a, in a hot housing market, it is not those folks. It is folks who are paying rents or trying to move out of a rental into a home, a, a home that they're buying for the first time. And we've made very incremental um, investments, and I haven't seen any significant events, investments in tenants long term, so renters. Um, these short-term programs that were emergency um, oriented are all drying up with federal funds. We didn't even do enough funding to get people through um, the winter with, with um, the VRAP, pro VRAP program, which was that temporary rental and utility assistance program. So we need to be much more strategic and we need to get into the details around where tenants are in housing investments and making sure that we strategically say this must be passed on through the landlord into tenants. For example, controlling rent for a certain period of times if a landlord is accessing um, the VHIP program. The other piece around economic dignity is childcare. Um, childcare and housing uh, are, to, are sort of intertwined with working families of what fa the, we, we, I'm one of them, struggling with. I have young kids myself and it is a massive problem. And we have been told by advocates for years now that to make a, a significant enough change, you have to think about two things related to childcare. You have to think about affordability for working families and you have to think about early educators as well, which are predominantly women in this field. And so the, he did not say a word about early educators. He talked about supporting family member, uh, working families up to 400% of federal poverty measure, which is still not all working families. That's only to a certain limit. Um, so I appreciate, of course, supporting the, the lowest income people, but he left out people who are just above that income level, who are still paying well more than 10% of their income on child care. And then I also did appreciate he went in a little bit about after school. That has no subsidies whatsoever, and it's a real struggle for families with kids over five of what you do after school and during the summer to, to be able to work a full-time job. It's, it's impossible to figure that out. So we have to do more there, but he didn't provide enough money to really come up with the solution we need. And I want to emphasize again, early educators are jobs that don't get exported, exported from the state. They are in our communities. We can even make more um, child care spots, which we also need in this whole issue, if we invest significant money in paying these people professional wages. They are professionals. They are educating our young children. They are supporting our young children. Shout out to my child care center. I am so appreciative of what they do every single day. I could not do what I'm doing without them, um, but this, the investment that the governor proposed is, is insignificant. We need something more like 175 million to 250 million roughly, and he did something, I forget the number now, but well below 100 million dollars. That will not get us there. Thanks so much. So it sounds like, so we've listened to the governor's speech. You've, uh, you and your colleagues are coming up with your impressions and your thoughts on um, the proposed budget. So what happens next? How does his budget get kind of carried forward and revised and eventually on a track to be approved and, and um, you know, put into action? That's a great question. So there's actually two things that start now. Um, we have what's called the Budget Adjustment Act, the BAAA, um, and that is going to go through first through all the committees to um, give our recommendation, our sign off on where we need to tweak this year's budget. So we're ha about halfway through the state fiscal year right now. It turns over on July 1st. And so there's a whole, and it, these are significant. They used, to, I don't think they were probably as significant before we had all these federal funds, but we basically come back in in January. It's about halfway through that fiscal year and we get to no, get reports on where is their surplus, where was money not spent, where was it um, spent completely, and where does money need to be shifted around for the final five or so months of the fiscal year. So that's the first thing we'll work on, and the governor sends along recommendations on how we should do that um, sta through state agencies around those requests. So we'll dive into that first, and there's no usually no new policy that comes out of that. It's just kind of moving things around of what we've already approved. But then we'll dive into the big budget, and that's one of the last things. Um, it starts in the House. It starts in the House. I'm going to say that confidently. I'm pretty, yes, it starts in the House. Um, and then we uh, we go through our evolved policy committees. Um, I serve on House Commerce and Economic Development, which is often called a, a mini money committee because we actually have a lot of big ticket items like workforce development and economic development, which has a lot of money um, that we have to allocate through policy decisions that we make. And then it goes over to the Senate. And then there's the great negotiation um, by the end. Of, it's one of the last things we usually pass at the end of the session because it goes back and forth. And there's a lot of things towards the end 
that get pulled out, pulled in. Um, so we started, but there's there's many weeks ahead around figuring out what um, what will be funded, and then frankly, how we're still going to do this dance with the federal money that um, uh, most has been allocated. But there are new infrastructure funds that we also have to learn related to climate and related to infrastructure um, money that gets kind of um, put on top of what is called base funding, which is the general fund money that that Vermonters generate within our tax system here. Okay. Kind of a complicated process. Yeah, it <laughs> What's is. going it on? It does start with the house. I was feeling a little in, in, um, insecure about that, but it does start with the house. Yes. And I want to circle back to one more thing that the governor said, um, which is that he uh, mentioned at the end an investment in supporting refugees and immigrants coming to Vermont, mm -hmm. and that got probably the biggest ovation of any, any of the comments that the governor said. Uh, the governor's proposal to invest $4 million in the refugee and immigrant community in the state of Vermont, I believe, was the only thing that got a full standing ovation um, in the chamber today. Uh, I am encouraged by that because we did a little bit of, of uh, consideration of increasing funding last fiscal year for the new office for um, refugees and immigrants. It's a new office set up by the state of Vermont that has literally one person at this point. Uh, so we invested about it. We were going to try to move more about upwards to a million dollars last year, but because of limited capacity, they we were moving a lot of federal money, of course, at the time. They actually didn't need all that money. They said that we can't actually move all that money. So I'm encouraged that, I guess, capacity has grown, interest has grown, need has grown around that. However, I think one of the things, again, a policy um, uh, question here is not all immigrants and refugees are welcome to the state in the same way. It was amazing to me, um, and not in a good way, how how um, people chipped over themselves to send state dollars out to Ukraine to support folks who are struggling in that um, conflict zone over over um, uh, in Ukraine. And yet we have, for years, not ha held the same level of welcome and belonging and inclusion kind of practices with people coming from who are black and brown coming from other parts of the world. And so I think if we're going to make this investment, I hope that we double down on what does being an inclusive state mean? How do we become um, a welcome state that really thinks about these folks as contributions to our community um, and really challenges the national rhetoric where it depends on where you come from if you're a valuable immigrant or refugee to our, our country. Um, the other part about that is we have to level up on language access um, for folks and really make that um, seamless within state government. We fail. We fail on a lot of levels right now with inclusivity. So I don't know where he's going to specifically say, um, propose to spend that $4 million. But language access and making sure there's cultural competency with employers, making sure our agency of commerce um, shows up with that level of technical support for businesses as much as they show up with, you know, um, how to turn a profit. You have to be good employers. You have to be inclusive and belonging uh, employers that value those pieces. So if if those are elements of it, great. I doubt four million will get us there. If with everything, if this is a priority, we need to be responsive to what the community needs and then put the money forward. Um, because I also worry that. Uh, we're, that some of this might be checking a box, when if we really want to make a significant investment of what's needed, um, it will take more than that to really help folks um, transition and stay in Vermont and figure out how to navigate these systems we talked about before, affordable housing, affordable childcare, et cetera. Because after folks are relocated after a year, there's a lot of federal money that dries up in terms of supports for folks, and we have to be thinking about that. Um, one last thing is, of course, there's, it's all well and good to put money towards an issue, but Vermont, as it's in, it, in it of itself, also needs to look at um, being true communities of inclusion, um, and that means really thinking about safety and belonging for um, black and brown folks, BIPOC folks, immigrants, people who's, where English is not their primary language. And I think um, leading by example as a state so that we make sure that we are, you know, there's a um, declaration of collusion going around, for example, with many um, towns. There's only 80 that have signed on at this point. So really leading with policy that supports communities um, growing in that way and really rethinking what does, what does you know, um, what do safe communities look like? How do we t talk about racism? Racism exists. Um, we are a whitest, uh, one of the whitest states on purpose. This is not by accident. And so we have to grapple with that other reality so that when folks are relocated here who are black and brown, that they truly are landing in a state that sees them and values them for who they are.